and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. In Africa, when I speak, I usually have what I call a dialogue sermon, where I'm interacting with you, asking you questions, and you're supposed to respond. Is that okay to do here today? It may not be very Presbyterian, because we like to do things decently and in, in order. Now, did you just hear the scripture that was just read? I like to, in Africa, ask them questions from the scripture to see if, in fact, they were listening. But I won't do that to you today. <laughs> How many of you watched the final four last night? I did. Well, I only got to watch one of the games. And I'm not allowed to say who won or who lost because Dan, who's running the video equipment back there, uh, wasn't able to be there last night to watch. And so he recorded and he doesn't want to know who won or who lost. So don't anybody tell him. But something struck me about that story, uh, or the final four, it's very similar to what happened in the story about Joshua. And you are saying, how in the world can it be similar? Well, Joshua and the armies of the tribes of Israel had just finished conquering the land. It was their final four, I mean, it was the finals, which we see recorded in the scriptures this morning. Here they are gathered after they've conquered all the land, and what's next? And Joshua challenges them to, to get rid of their foreign gods and to serve the Lord. And then they make a declaration, and this is what we would have done in Africa. We will serve the Lord. Now, all of you can say that after me. We will serve the Lord. And that's the declaration they made that they will not follow the gods of the Amorites and the gods from Egypt, but they will follow the Lord God who, whom they serve. And that's why they made that declaration. Now, what else did they do after making that de declaration? Joshua planted a rock as a witness. This rock is going, has heard what you have said, and it will be planted here as a permanent witness to the declaration that you made. And I was thinking in terms of the final four uh, last night, is there anything that makes a declaration that they were a part of the final four, whether loser or winner? And probably the only thing that they would get is a cap and maybe a t-shirt and I don't know, do they get a cup? Does anybody know? I don't know, but that cup then becomes like the rock that Joshua planted, which is a witness to the generations to come that they have won that game. I want to share a story about uh, what happened to my wife and I in 2014 and be thinking of it in terms of the scripture that we just read. In 2014, we were driving on a remote road in southern Ethiopia. I was going as fast as I could, about 23 miles an hour on this road. We rounded a corner and here in the middle of the road was a Surma standing with his AK-47. And I was going so fast, 23 miles an hour, that I couldn't stop. And he jumped off the road and as we passed him, he shot through the open window and hit my wife just below the nose and it came out the other side with about 20 teeth coming out as shrapnel and the same bullet came through and hit me in the collarbone, broke this collarbone, and then ricocheted up through the roof of the car. And it was my wife's teeth that uh, really did uh, any damage to me. One tooth hit me in the forehead and uh, put this eye out. So I was blinded in this eye. I had one good eye. 
And when I went to see my dentist in uh, Newton, Kansas, after we came back, he said, oh my gosh, there's an incisor in here that's not supposed to be in here. And I have a tooth of my wife and it's still there. And that's my rock that was planted as a witness that we went through this incident together. And I remind everybody the Bible says, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, and tooth of my tooth. <laughs> Just this last February, I was back in Ethiopia again. Uh, I've been trying to go back once every three months or so for a month at a time. And on February 21, the chief of police, a big Surma strapping policeman, uh, about six foot three or four, and he came to me and he says, do you want to go to Mardul tomorrow? Now let me tell you about Mardul. Back in the 70s, the Presbyterians had a missionary working there in Mardul, and his name was Don McClure. He and his wife and their children were working there, and when the Marxist government took over, he was forced to leave with his family, and the Surma, the chief of police father, in fact, was the chief of the area at that time, and he was shot by Mangistu uh, soldiers, the Marxist uh, uh, soldiers that came in, and so he lost his father to the Mangistu uh, soldiers, and he also lost his other relatives to the warriors from across the border in South Sudan from the Taposos that came. Anyway, he said, do you want to go to Mardul tomorrow? And I said, sure. And we welded up uh, a, a metal cross, painted it red, and took it with us for the intent of reconciling with a tribe from South Sudan that had fled across the border and was now resident in Mardul, seeking refuge in Ethiopia. And this was their uh, number one enemy, they, the Toposa from South Sudan. They had been cattle rustling for years. They had been, uh, whenever a cattle rustling would take place, people would be killed. And so they essentially were enemies and they asked me to go and be a reconciling factor, trying to bring reconciliation between the two tribes. And that's why we took this cross along as part of our reconciliation ceremony. Well, when we got there, there were about 30 Toposa warriors all sitting on the ground with their guns laying on the ground beside them, and only three women uh, were there. With me were four policemen from the Surma tribe carrying guns, and th that was their duty. They were police officers, and they were to guarantee the peace. And then maybe as many as five other Surma people uh, from the church as well as who were originally in the place of Mardul. Now, who can tell me who used to work at Mardul in the 70s, just to see if you're listening? One of our missionaries called Don McClure, Jr. In 1977, when they had to leave earlier that year, Don McClure's father was shot. He was also a missionary in Ethiopia working with the Somalis on the east side of Ethiopia, and he was shot and killed by Somali rebels. So that happened in that same year. So here we are now, these two groups, the Surma and the Toposa from South Sudan, who are hungry, looking for grazing for their cows, and looking for clean water, and fleeing the fighting in South Sudan. Well, the first thing we did as we all sat around together was to have a time of confession. You know, it says in the Bible that they needed to forgive the sins of their fathers as well as their own sins. So we recounted a lot of the sins of the past. And I told the story, since I'd been in Mardul before, years ago, I told the story of my wife and I being shot on that road. And I told how we forgave the shooter after he shot us. It just came naturally to us to forgive him. And they then had a litany of things that they also uh, shared about, you know, the sins of the past, the sins of the fathers. And we confessed those sins. And I told them, now we need to forgive each other after confessing these sins, which they did. 
But to make a permanent witness, we had brought this red cross along. And on the cross were written in three different languages, Father, forgive us. From the words of Jesus from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. We had written, Father, forgive us, in three languages, in the Toposa language, in the Surma language, and in English. Interestingly, the common language, the language by which we were able to communicate, was English. And I was an English speaker, so I was there to translate the English of the Toposas who had learned their English in Uganda and then put it into Surma. And uh, that was, uh, for me, very advantageous because here I was trying to orchestrate the, the reconciliation that was taking place. Anyway, a Toposa woman and a Surma woman took the cross and they carried the cross to a hole that we had dug on the top of a, an anthill we had brought a bucket full of sand and cement mixed and mixed it with water and made cement and we planted this cross permanently in cement as a witness to the whole community that they had done this reconciliation, that they had made this covenant of peace among them. And when I asked the, the men, please go out and collect some rocks because we wanted to make, mix rocks with cement, all the men just jumped to, and we had far more rocks than we needed, but I realized that this was an Old Testament pattern. Over and over in the Old Testament, you see them collecting rocks. When the children of Israel crossed the, uh, the Jordan River, they brought 12 rocks out of the river and set them up as an altar of witness. And am I going too long? A, a few more minutes. Okay. We're able to do that in Africa to, you know, coach each other and speak to each other. And so we planted this cross and stood around, and then after planting the cross, the Surma woman, whose father was killed by the Mangistu soldiers, who's an elder in the Presbyterian, not the Presbyterian, it's the Makaniyesus Church in Ethiopia, she took a, 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 a jug of water, you know, about a two-liter jug of water, and then after praying, she poured the water first on the hands of the women in front of the cross as a sign of the cleansing and the forgiving from sin. And then all the men came forward, both Surma and uh, Toposa. None of them were carrying their guns. They all came and washed their hands as a symbol of this peace and cleansing. But you know, there was more to the cleansing than just that. Uh, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, which they relate to very readily, that any time innocent blood is shed, that a curse comes on the land. And so the whole process of forgiving and the washing of hands was an attempt to break the curse that had come over this land over the years because of so, so many people being killed. And as soon as I told them that the curse now is broken because Jesus took on himself our sin and took on himself the curse that was on us and he bore our sins on the cross and he made his righteousness available to us, we were able to share that story with the people as we gathered around this cross that was standing there. You know, we also this morning have a witness in this church. Now, I'm sure we could look around and find a cross here and there, but there's another very, very strong witness which causes us to remember what Jesus did on the cross. Can anybody tell me what that is? Communion. Twice in the communion, words of communion, it says, remember, remember. This is done in order to remember what Jesus has done for us, that he died on the cross, that his blood was shed for us, and that because of that, the curse has been broken and we have been given life. <laughs>